Kate here, your community manager. Happy Wednesday. How's everyone doing tonight? Um, uh, I am excited for tonight's tonal talk. We have an oldie but goodie. Oldie in the sense that our guest tonight was one of my first tonal talk guests ever. So it's very cool to have him back. It's also going to be his third time on tonal talk. No big deal. Um, we're going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to pin this to the top of the group so that you can see it. Rochelle, my angel, is going to post it in the event invite so that you can find it or you can watch the playback if you can't make it live. And then if you can hear me, see me, please let me know in the comments because y'all know how it is. Mercury's and Gatorade or whatever. <laughs> um, so, okay, I see Arlene. Hi, Arlene. Also, let me know where you're tuning in from tonight. Um, thoughts and prayers are going out to everyone, everyone in Florida, all of our tonal members. Um, who many of them had to leave their tunnels behind, um, hoping that you all make it back to your homes safe and sound. Uh, so just know that we are thinking of you. We are behind you. Um, Robert, hello, hello. All right, good to see y'all. So shall we begin? I've got some fun updates for you. I'm really excited about them. Um, our first one is something that I posted about today in the community. It's a feature update. We have a new filter and row on trainer for classic programs. Now those classic programs are the ones that many of you know and love. They are where it's one coach with you and then it pans to other coaches showing the movements. You get to see a variety of coaches doing the different movements. Some hold it slightly differently. Some people's bodies move differently. So it's a good way um, to get different viewpoints of movements. So as you can see there, there's a filter now for live programs plus and classic programs, which is super great. So you can filter, find exactly what you want. And then there's also a row on your trainer under programs. There's now a programs plus row, a classic programs. I think there's a live programs row too. So um, now you can find the perfect program to suit your individual needs, which we love that. Um, I'm especially proud of the team on this one. This was something that y'all had asked for a lot in Feedback Friday and in comments in the group, and they were able to act on it really quickly. So huge props to the Tonal team. We love y'all. Let me know if you're excited about that feature. Um, let me make sure comments are coming in. Yes. Oh, hi, Pam. Good to see you in here, Pam. Hi, Rod, Dan. Great to see y'all. Okay, next up, we got the 20 and 20 for runners challenge starting on Monday. It is not too late to join. This is going to be a program with coach Christina Centenari. She's going to take you through her 20 for 20, 20 in 20 for runners <laughs> program. It is 20 workouts um, designed to help improve your running and cycling, if that's your thing. Um, and then we've she's built in some core workouts and some extra mobility workouts on the weekends. All the workouts are under 20 minutes. So you can, well, don't hold me to that. Maybe some are like 22, 23, but around 20 minutes. So you can fit them in with those long runs that you may be doing, depending on what you're training for. So this challenge is going to be great for anyone who is training for a race, anyone who is looking to get into running, or anyone who just wants to balance their cardio cardio and their training, especially if you're a cyclist. Um, so head into the challenge group. I linked it above. Um, you're going to get four Q and A's with Christina, which she is just so incredibly knowledgeable on this topic. She's completed Ironman. She's a certified run coach. She regularly runs like 25 miles, just no big deal. <laughs> so she's the real deal. She knows what she's talking about. And you get direct access to her four times during this program. Um, and you also get to meet some, some tonal folks. So hop in there. Your first 20 and 20 for runners workout starts on Monday, October 3rd. Okay. Next up, we have our October book club. It is Next Level by Stacey Sims. I'm going to read the full title because it's great. It is Next Level, Your Guide to Kicking Ass, Feeling Great, and Crushing Goals Through Menopause and Beyond by the incredible Dr. Stacey Sims, who is also a Tonal Advisory Board member and world-renowned women's health and fitness researcher. Y'all, she is changing the game. Um, I'm also very honored to welcome her back into the OTC for a member Q&A in October. So grab your book, start reading, write down your questions. I'm going to get that event invite up soon so you can drop your questions in there for Stacey. And then she's going to go live and answer them. That's the perk of being a Tonal member, y'all. 
So grab your book, jump into the book club group. Um, we meet on the final Thursday of the month at 5 p.m. Pacific time to all chat on a Zoom call. It's super fun. Um, and the one for this one will be October 27th. So join us. Okay, moving on. We're almost there, y'all. We're almost there. But I do have a few member spotlights that I really want to get to. Okay, this is awesome. So this is Michael Adler. Michael posted that they turned 71 last Thursday, almost five months with Tonal and already needing new shorts and pants. Michael, this is fantastic. Someone please tag Michael Adler. Let him know that we are cheering him on. But what's even better is that someone posted in the comments this photo. Yeah, look at my production skills here today. Um, Krista McIntosh said, my mom is almost 70 and did the same thing a few nights ago. Um, I was impressed. Hope to be as flexible as you two as I age. And this is just a reminder, y'all, that age is just a number. We are limitless. You can do whatever you set your mind to. So we don't all need to be doing headstands and handstands or whatever stands, but just know that you control your destiny. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight with Travis. So I just thought this was really timely. And then also there's one more member spotlight that I want to get to real quick. This one is Dustin. Well, this is his lung. Dustin Sapp, who says, this is a bit of a different before and after. And I'm going to paraphrase this because it's it was a little bit long. Nearly six years ago, my lung popped for the fourth or fifth time, and I could no longer get a full breath. I was diagnosed with a genetic cystic lung disorder, and the humidity in the Midwest and South made it impossible to do any sort of physical activity or even talk for an extended period. Since then, we moved halfway across the country where I can breathe well in the mountain air, develop healthier eating habits as a family, and slowly begin my journey of trying to improve my lungs. I added tonal to the mix in December, and it has been a complete game changer. This Monday, I managed to hike to over 14,000 feet at the top of Condry Peak. This is the easy 14er, according to locals, but it might as well have been Everest to me six years ago. Thanks to this group for the continued inspiration every day. So this is just another reminder, y'all. You control your destiny. Um, Dustin, we're so happy that you are breathing better and that you are building strength on tonal. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this. And someone please... Uh, please tag Dustin Sapp in the comments so that he knows that we're cheering him on too. Okay, one more. I know I said that was it, but one more. <laughs> I'm really excited about this one. We are starting a new series in the, in the Tonal community called The Why Behind the Workout. And this is gonna be where a Tonal coach comes on live with a member of Tonal's curriculum team to give a mini presentation and discussion about one of the pieces of content on Tonal. So if you are into program design, if you like to learn about strength training topics, if you just wanna geek out about health, fitness, physiology, programming, this is going to be uh, the session for you. It's gonna be every other week, hopefully in the community with a rotating tonal coach and um, a member of the curriculum team. Our first one will be next Thursday and I'm going to announce who and what program we'll be diving into tomorrow. So any guesses of what we're going to be talking about and who's going to be coming on, leave them in the comments. So yeah, I'm very excited about that. It's going to be fun. I think you're going to like it. Okay. I promise that was my last one. Now for the main event. So this evening, I'm very excited to chat with someone who has, who was one of the first um, Tonal members I got to know on a deeper level. And he's been a constant source of inspiration to me personally um, since, since we met and following him on Instagram. Um, and if you're new here, get ready to meet one of the most tenacious members of this community. And if you've met Travis before on Tonal Talk, find out what he's been up to in the last couple of years. And so tonight we'll be really honing in on what it takes to develop a champion mindset and grit and determination. Um, so please help me welcome two-time gold medalist and Tonal athlete, Travis Gartner. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? I'm doing well. How are you? Good to see That's you again. Good. It's so good to see you. You have a different background <laughs> since we last chatted. Did you move? Yes, we moved. Actually, we moved out to the country. Um, to have, one of the reasons to, to be safer, but also just be safer while I'm out the bike training. Um, yes, so training safe. out here has just been fantastic since we got here. And I got a new office as a result, too. So new background. 
It looks great. And I, I swear, like, I need whatever filter you have going on. If there's one, like your skin just looks so perfect. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> what, what do I need to do? <laughs> it's definitely, the camera is helping with that for sure. <laughs> You're looking good. And it's so good to see you. I know you've been up to all sorts of things since we last talked. Um, but I want to back up a little bit. And for anyone who's new here, because we have tons of new members, I'd love for you to just give a background about who you are, what you do, and what makes you so awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, going back to your theme before about age not being a limiter and fighting through what you can do to better yourself in life, I think, you know, you mentioned I'm, I'm a two-time gold medalist. So I, I did compete in the Paralympics at a much younger age where I won, we won as a team twice in the sport of wheelchair basketball. Um, but I was doing that when I was half the age that I am now, learned a lot. But what I'm learning now is that, yes, I adapted much different back then uh, as a younger fellow and uh, was able to recover a lot better <laughs> than I do now, whereas now I'm trying a new sport, which is paracycling, specifically on a hand cycle and um, trying to, there we go, great picture. You can see the picture of me on the hand cycle there during a time trial. So it gives you an idea of what it looks like. I think a lot of people when they see hear hand cycling may not know exactly what that looks like. So you can see me on the hand cycle there. This is my new sport. Uh, it's a pretty competitive sport. Often we get the question when they see that picture, well, how fast are you going? We typically time trial between 26, 27, 28 miles an hour. So they're pretty, pretty quick. You're pretty aerodynamic, as you can see, by the way, that we're lying there in a recumbent position pedaling with our hands. Um, so back, yeah, so 20 years later, trying to go back uh, as an international athlete to compete against the best in the world. Um, so I took up this journey back in 2017, just before you and I started talking. And since then, um, had, had some good, decent success in the sport. I've been on the podium on an international basis three times, um, both first, second, and third. So um, had some success in that journey on uh, early on and um, also have my day job, which pays the bills. Disabled sports do not pay the bills for the record. <laughs> and so uh, my day job is I'm a pension risk consultant. So I help corporations manage the overall risk in their pension plans alongside with my, my family of five. But not to mention all of that avid tonal user, as you know, and dove right into tonal as soon as I found it. And we could talk more about that, but it's been a huge part of my overall journey. I remember when you started training on Tonal. We actually did a whole Tonal talk on how you train on Tonal. So if anyone's interested in that, I can link it in the comments. It's pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, you you mentioned like Tonal was a game changer for you and you almost didn't want to tell anyone about it. <laughs> exactly. No, that's my, my secret. That <laughs> and I've actually had, I think, two or three of your competitors reach out to me directly. <laughs> oh, really? That's fantastic. Yeah. That's I good. Said, hey, That's can I get a tunnel? And I say, yeah, here's the link. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so sorry about that. But you know, <laughs> elevating the sport, what we do. Absolutely. Let's make everybody better. <laughs> but you, you, as you mentioned, you have a full-time job. And it's a pretty serious job. You have three children. You have a wife. I'm guessing you have friends. Um, you have like this whole life. And on top of all that, that's a full plate for anyone. You have, you know, full-time competitive athletic training, not just recreationally, but for that Olympic, Paralympic level. Right. What compels you to do all of that? Like most people would be like, you know what? I, I, I got my gold medal. Z I'm good. Like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go for a few rides and I'm gonna lift on tonal and that's gonna be it. What compels you to keep competing at that level and to keep pushing yourself further and further? Yeah, it's definitely a full plate, as you say. And, and I, I can't say it's easy. It's not easy. I have to work daily at managing my stress and figuring out what my priorities are gonna be that day and, and figure out how I'm gonna be as efficient as possible with trying to accomplish my goals in a given day. Um, and I think one of the themes that we'll get into as we talk more about perseverance is, um, for me, reinventing myself and testing my limits is something that I've always wanted to do. And I'll tell you a really silly story. When I was, when I was young, I remember my father had to come and talk to me because whenever I was too bored and I wasn't doing enough things and finding ways to keep myself busy. I would just cry. I was just crying. <laughs> you be talking like two, three or like 16? No, we're talking like, you know, eight or nine. So we're, <laughs> we're between that, right? But I would just cry. And he's, why, you know, he had to come alongside me and just say, listen, you, I know you like to be busy, but there, there's so many different ways that you can better yourself in life, even at this age. 
And so I think that sort of, well, I don't cry when I get bored. That mentality, I think, has sort of spilled itself into my adult life as well. I, I, I like to be busy. I like to find new ways of improving myself. And, you know, similar to I did wheelchair basketball and reached my limits there, if you will, and got into a corporate career, reached a lot of those limits too. Paracycling is a way for me to reinvent myself and start that process over of what are my limits? How do I define them? How do I pass them? How do I rinse and repeat and continuously go as far as I can to be the best person that I can be in this, in this case, the best paracyclist that I can be um, if from that situation. So I think that sort of compels me to keep going and has a lot to do with uh, what we're here to talk about today. So now you mentioned a lot of what is considered to be a growth mindset. You are always looking to improve. How can you beat yourself? Do you think that that's something that you were born with and it's just innate to you? Or do you think that's something that we can all cultivate or a little bit of both? I think it's both. I think that because I was born, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a disabled athlete, obviously, and you didn't quite see it in the picture that you can kind of see it, but I have no left leg and I'm missing half of my right leg. So I'm a congenital double amputee, if you will. So from day one, I had to learn how to adapt to life, the things that life is throwing at you. There was no you know, script for how to handle those things. If you've seen one person with a disability, you've seen one person with a disability, we're all very unique. And so having to learn at a really early age how to adapt, I think contributed to that later mm. on in life, to having that growth mindset, reinventing, finding new, new ways to push through limits and redefining myself, um, that contributed to it. That said, I think a lot of it was also learned as I as I negotiated my way through all of those things in life. Um, you know, when things are hard, you've got to know you've got to know why you're doing what you're doing, and you need to stop and really think through that. And and, and I think that's also something we'll be able to talk about today as well. I mean, that's just such a beautiful reframe of you know being born with half of half of a leg. Some people could look at that and say, "Why me?" why did this happen? Be angry, be upset. And I'm sure maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe you went through some of those phases, but um, you're at least at a point in your life where you can look back and say, hey, that made me who I am. And that gave me the mindset that I have. And I'm so grateful for it, which I think is incredible. big time. I think, fr frankly, sometimes I think about it as an advantage, like you just said, <laughs> you know, there, there are times where it's not easy. You can't lie about that. But it's an advantage over some folks, given that I had to learn those skill set at such an early age. And that's developed into to who I am today. It's so cool. Um, okay, so you were training hard for Tokyo in 20, 2020. It got 2020 pushed. 2020 slash 21. Yeah, right. Got pushed. Um, <laughs> Thanks, COVID. You were training really hard for a qualifying spot on the team. So I, I think it's a little bit different how they select the teams for hand cycling. Yes. Um, unfortunately, sadly, tragically, you <laughs> missed a spot by 17 seconds. That's right. Ugh. Okay, so walk us through that. What did that feel like for you? What was that emotionally like, mentally like, and what made you keep going? Good question. So I think the, the order you presented, it makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Because at first, the, the response was purely emotional. And I had to work through that. But at the end of the day, you know, we can't rely on our emotions. They're, they're going to trick us. And, but they're there for a good reason. We kind of work through that. And I think as I was preparing for this conversation to do, honestly, there were some therapeutic moments there mm -hmm. thinking back through some of those emotions so working through the emotions is important but i don't think they should be there to they're not necessarily what you should be relying on to make big decisions so that'll get into the why did i continue as we get to that but that emotion at the time when i didn't make it was very very strong i mean the, the, everything i was doing was geared towards tokyo that was that was the end goal and I knew what it would be like to make the Paralympics. I've been there twice. I've won. So I come at it from all angles and I'd done everything I possibly could to, to try and make that a success and it sacrificed a lot as well. And, you know, I had people along the way who were, were super supportive and um, they would often correct me. You know, if I said, oh, if I make it to Tokyo, there'd be laughter even from some fellow paracyclists. You'd be laughing. Why do you have to use the word if? You know, you're going to make it. So in my mind, you hear those things. It didn't slow me down. It didn't stop pushing. But in my mind, it was a lock. You know, I was a lock. I was going. I know I had to push hard, but I just kind of felt like I was going. So when I didn't, devastation. Yeah. You know, I 
for some time, I didn't even want to look at my bike. Mind you, that was only three or four days. It probably should have been longer. But different story. <laughs> Recovery is important <laughs> and breaks are important. Um, Your wife's like, yes, a break. And you're like, <laughs> That was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I just felt like a failure, if you will. Like I had failed my support system. I failed my sponsors who took a risk in supporting me and investing in me. I failed my employer who gave me the flexibility ability to train towards this end goal of going to Tokyo. I feel my family who sacrificed so much by allowing me to be away from home uh, more than an ideal situation. And, and through all that, and we'll get to kind of why I decided to continue, you know, I remember talking to some sponsors afterwards when I said, hey, I'm, I'm looking to continue to train. Would you be even open to continuing our partnership? And frankly, I was expecting them to say, no, I would just fail, <laughs> right? Like why nobody wants to back a, a failure, if you will. Again, this is the emotional yeah. aspect of what I was going through. And, you know, I, at first I was really surprised when a lot of them had the, of course, type of attitude, like let's work, we're going to continue this partnership and let's, let's work together. And that, that wasn't a given in my mind, but externally, when you, when you're not the person with, you know, fighting through all these emotions, you know, you can see clearly through that. Um, one of the biggest things that I had to work through was you know i like to have all of us do right we like to have trying to have some control over the ultimate outcome of what we're trying to do and um so how much how can i better myself and if i better myself what what control what what, what outcomes do i have there and there's a unique aspect of disabled sport and, and paracycling is even more unique where, because it's such a messy, it's a very, me disabled sport is messy. It's messy, messy, messy. Because, you know, like I said, once you yes. know. Quantify or to level, right? To level, to level set. That's exactly right. Because well, like we said, once you know one person with a disability, you know one person. So we're, we all have complete different abilities. Yeah. Um, and how do you decide who's going when, you know, I'm going to be much faster than somebody who's got a much different level of disability. So how do you work through that? It's very complex and difficult. The way paracycling works through that, um, one of the things they do to try and make sure that there's equal opportunity, and in a way actually they've taken away equal opportunity, is the global governing body, the UCI, they give themselves the power to say, they're gonna come into a given country and say, okay, USA, you've earned eight spots, for example. I, you know, my numbers aren't correct, but I'll give you an example. You've earned eight spots. We're gonna, you were, we're, we're taking four from you, and we're gonna name who we want for four of those spots based on the different levels of disability we think need to be at the games and be represented. So there's some social and political reasons for their choices, but at the end of the day, when I showed up at the Paralympic trials, there were only four spots left. For your level or for? All, all 13 oh, wow. different levels of disability, there was only four spots left. And all of those 13 different levels of disability have their own event at the games so you could have 13 world championships and nine world champions aren't going there's only four okay. spots left and i don't compete you know we don't compete against each other once we get there but we compete for those spots mm. so anyway you know it, it 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 it's it's messy and it's unfortunately in paracycling the uci is the only governing body that does that where they come in and say we have the authority to pick who we want to pick um but that takes a lot of the control away from the country a given country to say we're going to send the best, best athletes that we think are mode are podium potential athletes and so no matter how hard you've done, you've tried or your success in the past, you know, I'm in a very deep classification with a lot of athletes across the globe. So they're never, ever going to pick my class as one to protect, if you will, um, which makes it actually, we're more, comp more competitive class makes it more difficult to even qualify within that class. What so, do you mean by a deep category? Um, deep there's a lot of folks across the globe in my category that okay. show up and compete to be at the game. So it's a very mature category, if you will. And there's some other classifications. There might only be one or two in a given country, if that. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're trying to protect some of those classifications, if you will. Got it. That's a lot. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot. And it's difficult. <laughs> I don't expect people to under fully understand what I'm saying. But what, the, what I had to work through was, do I want to continue in a sport where somebody some global governing body is coming and taking away a lot of the control over where where i end up mm -hmm. whether or not i'm going to make the games or not and so that that was kind of go this leads into the kind of the, the second question that you asked is, is why did how did i decide to continue training and to continue going on after tokyo and 
it took it took me some time. So I went got through the emotional <laughs> phase that we talked about. And I had to think about the logic. So first, first in the logic, I had to address this. Look, I what, what about the control I have over my 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 future, my success of actually going to the next games, which is in Paris? And does the UCI taking away a lot of that control? Is that enough to stop me? And, and the answer I came at was obviously no, because I continued. And, and the reason for that is the Paralympic Games aren't the end all be all. They like to think that they are, and they're supposed to be the pinnacle, but they're not because there's limited spots and all this all these things come into play. Every year there's a World Championships in Paracycling. Every year. And the best are there. No, mm -hmm. Nobody's limited by spots available or by the UCI coming in saying, you got to take these people. So we all go. All the best go. We get to compete against the best. So as I think about myself, I still had a lot to learn in paracycling. And if I was using paracycling as a way to better myself and to figure out what my limits were, to strive to go past what those limits are and redefine them again and again, rinse and repeat, I still, I wasn't finished yet. <laughs> I wasn't finished with that. And I could still do that even if I didn't have the control over, say, making it to, to Paris as much as I want to go to Paris in 2024. Um, so lots of international competition available uh, for me to compete against the best, to test myself and to continue thinking about what is my best and how do I continue to stretch myself in that way. So it sounds like you had to change your why a little bit. You had to go through yes. all of the stages of, you know, grief almost of uh, losing that spot and then reframe your why. And it sounds like you've, you've done that. So now you can use it as a tool to better yourself and you can still fuel your competitive spirit through the world championships instead of the Paralympics. Absolutely. And I think that's super in important to, to be able to, when you're, you're setting goals, to be able to sit down and, and, and really clearly articulate why you're doing something and why you want to do something. Um, and as I went continue through that process, you know, some more you know, logical truths were, I love hand cycling. Yeah, I didn't get into a hand cycle until adulthood. Most people grow up and they get on a bike and they learn to ride a bike and it's freeing and they think it's fantastic. I didn't get that freeing experience until I was adult. So I love hand cycling, love fitness. I'm always going to try and maintain a fit lifestyle, regardless of whether or not I'm in competitive sport. The hand cycle is a great way to get fit. So I was going to continue hand cycling no matter what. I was going to continue doing it a lot because I love fitness and I like making it a big part of my life. I like painful challenges of pushing myself, right, even through that, through that fitness. And I'm super competitive. So if you add all those things together, you like hand cycling, you like working really hard, you like fitness, you're going to do it a lot, and you're super competitive, why wouldn't I just keep racing? <laughs> what percentage do you think, uh, you know, if you had to say it was like, oh, 50-50 if I'm going to retire or not, or was it 30%, 70%? What do you think that split was for you? And I think this, this speaks to the emotions, right? So as I was going through the emotional response, 70% I was done. Ugh. As I worked through that and thought about the logic about why, again, reinventing the why and thinking about the why and defining that, and really for what it meant, I, I very quickly went from 70 to zero. I was in. I was all in. Mm -hmm. You feel fully committed all in again? 100%. Yes. Yeah, there's no question. <laughs> so good. Um, okay, so uh, I posted a photo of you today in the community where you had a little, you took a little tumble. Yeah. There. <laughs> Is that not one of the most epic pictures you've ever I seen? I can make it bigger. Mm, I don't think so, but everyone can see it. Um, what the heck happened here? <laughs> That is the question. So that, that is the world championships this year. As I mentioned, they happen every year. So despite not qualifying for Tokyo last year, I did qualify for the world championships this year. Had the Where opportunity to go. This was actually in Baycomo, Canada, okay. uh, which was nice to be um, not have to worry to work through uh, the time change. Um, mm -hmm. And so this was the final event. It was the road race. And this kind of goes back to setting and resetting limits, if you will. I had been teaching myself how to corner better and was taking corners at much faster speeds than I ever had. And what happened in the, in, the, in, the world, in the road race here at World Championships was there was about four of us left in the breakaway. And it's about, about a two hour race to give you an order of magnitude. And you know, we were roughly halfway through and four of us left. But when there's four people left, it gets very aggressive because everybody, three people left means everybody is gonna be on the podium, right? So whenever there's four, there's starts to be a lot of different attacks. And people are attacking and trying to dwindle that group down as fast as they can to three to guarantee their podium spot. Wait, attacks? Like, are people like ramming into you? No, from a, a cycling perspective, attacks is sort of um, basically attacking the group with, with speed and okay. trying to get them to the point where they're going to give up. Okay, okay, got it. Um, so in this case, what happened with this attack was actually the fastest guy in the world 
slowed himself down. It's a very smart attack. And I, I, I saw him doing it. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I actually I actually looked over my shoulder and called him a jerk while he was doing it because I knew he was, I knew what he was about to do. And he smiled. <laughs> so he <laughs> so he's the fastest. He backs himself off from the four of us. And he's he's the fastest in the world. And then he just comes from a distance in the back, you know, getting as much speed as he can so that when he hits the group, he's going much faster than we are. So in order for us to catch him, we have to burn a lot of matches to you know, to catch up to and make that speed up to get back with him. And he had done that just before a long descent. And so what I thought was, listen, I've been really testing myself on corners and I'm, I'm cornering better. I, I think I can take this turn. So this turn here in this picture is at the bottom of that hill. So he launches in fact, top of the hill. We had 50 miles an hour going down the hill. This turn here, I, I take it multiple times. This is all completely my fault. What I tried to do though was smart. I was going to back off before the turn so that I could take it faster than the others and kind of slingshot my way past them, if you will, to the attacker, knowing I could take it pretty quickly. All a good plan, except I didn't leave enough space. So what happened was I met oh. the others in the middle of the turn. And you can't correct your line. I was going 37 miles an hour. You can't correct your line at that speed in the middle of a turn. So I hit the back of somebody. Then I went off, as, as you can see, the tires in this picture, those were there because they knew it was a really dicey turn. The tires were there filled with water as a wall for somebody who might do something silly like what I did. <laughs> and you crash into the tires instead of the tree. Um, so yeah, I hit the back of them. They actually just got shot forward, but I went off my trajectory into the tires and flew through the air, as you can see, kind of flipped almost a 180 and ended up with three small minor fractures. Hmm. Um, How are you healing? surprisingly well i should not be healing this well actually i went for follow-up x-rays a couple weeks ago and the, the fractures have healed so i'm back on the bike training again which is which is fantastic so with something like this where you fell you literally fell and you know we talk about in life a lot life knocks you down and mm -hmm. you might get off your training schedule you might you know just life comes at us what do you do after something like that like what's your process for like you just said you I've, I can see how you've learned from it. You already know what to do next time. Like, what was your process for coming back, standing up after that fall? The, the emotional response was much less in this in this instance. So I could get straight to the logic because I, I look back at it and thought, I don't have any regrets over what I did. I, I need to learn. You need to learn, and you can't test yourself in that type of a situation in everyday everyday races. Frankly, for a paracyclist to race against the best, to actually test yourself with that intensity, the only time you're going to get it is overseas. So whereas a lot of able-bodied athletes can get on a bike and go compete locally and learn and test their limits in those situations, I, I, I need to test my limits when I'm, when I'm overseas internationally. That only happens a few times a year. So frankly, ideally, when you test your limits, you don't do it when the stakes are so high, <laughs> like the world championships. But I, I have no regrets over what happened. So emotionally, I respond to that thinking, I'm going to test my limits and I'm going to, once I get, once I learn how to corn faster, I'm going to try and corner faster from there. I'm going to reset those limits, rinse and repeat every single time, redefine them and then set and set new goals. So that, that was just part of that process, if you will. It's unfortunate it has to happen when the stakes are that high, but that's just how it happens. So I, so I, you know, I felt fine about it. Um, really got through that emotional and got right to the logic of, of how I'm going to move forward. There's that growth mindset again. <laughs> Now, what advice do you have for members in the community who are looking to develop the mental toughness that you have, or even half the mental toughness that you have? I'd take half. Um, <laughs> that grittiness, that persistence, that like nothing stops you, truly. I've been watching you for three years, and you always attack every challenge with a smile and with, you know, the best attitude. Like, how do we, how do, we do that? What's your advice for us? Um... One of the things I've had to learn, we go back to sort of learning versus kind of being born with that is we, we can all do a lot more than we think we can in all likelihood. You know, our bodies tell us to stop when we're only 40% there. David Goggins taught us that in book club. There we go. Right. It's a great stat. So a lot of the times one of one of the persons, people in my support system, one of the things he told me before the races, he sent me a video, he said 40%, 40%, 40%. That's what you got to think about because you're going to want to quit. When you're only 40% yeah. there, <laughs> so you got 60% yeah. left, but your body's right. telling you, you better quit now. Right. Um, so but I thought it was flipped. I thought you had 40% left when your body tells you no. Is it, you have 60%? Yeah, it doesn't matter. As long as I think 40 and <laughs> I, I know that I'm not anywhere near where I need to 
stop that's that's the point right Basically, don't stop <laughs> don't stop don't stop and, and that we can do more than we think we can yeah um and and so that i think was an important lesson for me to learn over life as i set new limits that there's there's even further that i can go as, as i work towards that and, and so the, from an advice perspective it's we can do more than we think we can it's what we talked about before defining the why mm -hmm. know why you're doing something and clearly be able to articulate that how does it fit within your overall priorities? How much does consistency matter for a given goal so that you can set yourself up in advance for success there to make sure that consistency is at play? And as you go, remind yourself, stop and remind yourself along the way for all the things that you've done, the small things that have added up and contributed to where you are today. Remind yourself where you were, what you did and how you got there. Yeah. Celebrate the journey every step. We're always telling people in here to, you know, even if you, even if you did, you got on Tolna for 10 minutes, but you weren't planning on doing something. Celebrate that. Post it in the community. Give Absolutely. yourself high five, something. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think once, you, once you're able to do that, you're, not, you're, you're thinking logically, right? You're saying, this is what I know. I'm, I'm clarity of mind. This is what I want to do. Here's my, here's my goals and I'm going to set them. When your emotions come to play, which they did for me and we talked right. about, and you're tired and you're hurt and you're distracted. Remember, you set your goals with clarity of mind. So you just kind of have to make the decision to follow the playbook that you laid out for yourself. When you laid it out, when you had clarity of mind, because you knew why you wanted to do it mm -hmm. and you knew what you needed to do to do it. Now you just got to go and do that even when you're tired and your mind tells you to stop doing it. <laughs> How often do you skip training sessions? Oh, uh, never. <laughs> If I skip a training session, it's because I started it and I didn't know what my level of fatigue really was. So we attract my level of fatigue. Um, but if I get into a session and all of a sudden it's like, I, I'm not performing anywhere near what it's going to take to complete this. That's when your body really is saying it's time for recovery. So I'll skip that session for sure. But I don't go, I don't, you know, I don't skip one before I'm supposed to start it. If that's, if that's part of the question. That's, yeah, that was my point. So <laughs> next time, y'all, if you're thinking about skipping your session, just remember that Travis already biked, like, what, how many miles at 4 a.m.? <laughs> that's right, yeah. Because <laughs> that gets my butt out of bed. So I'm hoping that could be helpful for others. <laughs> and, and in all weather, you live up in Seattle, right? So, yes, I mean, yeah. All that's Absolutely. Not even Cycling in the rain, cycling in the cold. Although um, as you get a little older, I spend more time in the indoor trainer in the winter times. But um, yeah, definitely get exposed to all of it. And um, yeah. that's another, yeah, just I have to set, because of that cold in the morning and I have to train before my work day and before the family gets up, I have to set myself up so that I can be comfortable and don't give myself reasons to say no. Right. Oh, it's too cold out there where the trainer is or there's this, that, and the other thing. You got to set all that up. Well, let's get tactical for a second. So, you know, that saying like, you and Beyonce have the same 24 hours in the day. Well, I'm going to start, I'm going to make a meme that's like you and Travis have the same 24 hours in the day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think you do more than Beyonce with less, you know, nannies and butlers and help. So, right. <laughs> I don't know if Beyonce has butlers, but in my mind. Something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Assistance. Assistance, for sure. <laughs> but um, what tactical things do you do or that you can teach us so that we can get the most out of every day, just mm. like you do? Yeah. And so tactics, because it's about being proactive. Mm -hmm. So knowing what those tactics are and finding them are, are, are super important. Otherwise, it's just there's just no possible way. So for me, it's it's I've always tried to find new ways to be proactive about setting myself up for success and finding more reasons for me to say yes and less to say no. Mm -hmm. um, so getting things on my calendar, for example, re both recovery and workout times and all the things I knew. And, and then I know I have to do in a given day before I let all the other things sort of cloud that up. Um, preparing for the next day, the day before, right? From a nutrition perspective, from the equipment being set up and ready to get on the bike, clothing, all those types of things are ready so that in the morning when I'm less likely to want to say yes and I'm groggy, I can say, I, you know, there's less reasons for me to say no and I can just kind of go on autopilot, if you will, have your coffee maker ready, right? <laughs> I clean out the beans and everything the night before, so I just hit the button, right? So again, that'll, that'll help get me going. But brains, just brainstorm ways in your particular situation to make it easier to say yes in those moments where you don't want 
to say yes. You know, having a, frankly, a tone, that's one of the reasons I got tonal to begin with was just having an exercise machine at home. But this was pre COVID, right? The less yeah. reason for me to say, I don't want to get in my car and drive to the gym to get this workout in. I'm going to go downstairs. And even if I only have 20 minutes, I got something in. Well, that 20 minutes used to be taken up by the drive. So I wouldn't even do it then, right? Because then it was like, if I want to get something in, it's an hour, hour and a half at minimum. But yeah, having the tonal unit at home, it was just, there's no reason why you can't get a 20 to 30 minute workout in, in, in a given day. I'd love to hear in the comments if anyone has tips, like Travis just said, you know, he, he cleans the beans out before the night before, so he can just go and press play on his coffee maker. I have other things, but I don't like coffee. Okay. But um, in the comments, like what, what, if you have tips or tricks that work in your life for getting your days started right and maximizing your mornings or your afternoons or wh whatever time of day, um, let us know in the comments. I'd love to get like a little list going so we can all inspire each other. Um, I'm trying to think what I do. Sleep. If you're not drinking coffee, you must sleep well. I do sleep well. I, I have matcha or chai instead of coffee. Okay. I just don't like the taste of yeah. coffee. That's so about yeah. like half the amount yeah. of caffeine. Pretty sensitive to caffeine. We, we um, joke that sleep is very important. And um, one of the things I've learned is to, you know, make sure I, I there's a, a certain window at night is when your melatonin releases. And that's how you're going to go to sleep, right? That's yeah. how you're going to go to sleep well. So going to sleep at the consistent time, almost every day, mm. try to get less than 30 minutes of variation around that time. And what you're time getting you up. Bed? I go to bed about nine Oof. plus or minus 20 minutes, probably. Wow. Good three kids. What time do they go to bed? Eight. Okay. Well, it's, it's scheduled. Because <laughs> yeah. if it's 7.55 and they're not looking ready, trust me, daddy's, yeah. daddy's, daddy's out. <laughs> no bedtime <laughs> stories tonight, kids. Nope. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, but by going to bed at a consistent time, you get better sleep. Um, and by getting up at a consistent time, even if you necessarily don't need to, that is a big effect on your overall um, system and getting that, that that sleep really helps you get through the day, obviously. That's kind of my uh, my struggle in the mornings. If I feel like I didn't get a good night's sleep, then I'm like, well, it's better for me health-wise to sleep an extra hour because I read we read uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew mm. Walker in book club. And so I feel like that gives me a pass. But what you're saying is better that I should back it up the night before of, hey, why didn't, why didn't you sleep? So that I can actually get up when I say I'm going to. Um, in the comments, Joy says, agreeing with prep and scheduling. Absolutely. It's bedtime. Rod says, journaling and goal setting first thing in the morning, 5 a.m. has changed everything for me. Much more productive mm. and get to, be no later than, get to bed no later than 9 p.m. Rod, there I love, love that. You were doing that before the 5 a.m. club. Right now we're reading a book called the 5 a.m. club and nobody likes it. <laughs> 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 not because of the message. It's just not a good book. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> Eric says, clothes ready, pre-workout in the fridge. Bridge, alarm set for 4 a.m. and in front of tonal by 4 10 hell yeah love it love, love it. it we got some goal setters in here love that that's fantastic um, how often do you set goals and reevaluate your goals um probably four times a year we'll sit back and kind of check back on how things are going what we we're trying to do and mm -hmm. if they're being effective we now, now we need to adjust right now once a year there's a major you know step back so right now i'm in that period of writing things out, mm. multiple drafts, getting feedback, going back and forth with that feedback. And again, re defining your why and making sure you can clearly articulate it um, and reminding yourself of what those things are. So yeah, right now I'm about halfway through that process, that once a year process of really writing things out and getting feedback and buy-in from my support system. What's a, why September, October? What, what's this? Most people, I feel like do that in January. Why this time of year for you? For me, I just align it with the cycling season, right? So world championships typically happens in kind of August, September. And once that's okay. done, there's a little break and kind of the whole year starts over. So for me, my, I kind of consider my year starts over on 10 one. And so do you, oh, well, happy new year coming up. Yeah, uh, thanks. <laughs> Do you, do you do this only for hand cycling or do you kind of take your life and say, okay, personal goals here, professional goals here, athletic goals here? I'm much better, better at it with hand cycling. I'll say that I'm very, much more formal about it with hand cycling with my yeah. personal life, kind of fiscally um, with my wife. We also do it once a year at the end of March where we sit down and we, we say yeah. uh, budgeting, for example, we, we budget, we do forecasts in the next five years. What are our priorities? Where's all of our money going? How did we do last year versus those types of goals? So that's, that's another formal process from a fi 
family financial perspective that we know where every dollar is going and why it's going into a certain direction. And what is that going to look like for us five years from now? That's awesome. Um, something I should get better at. So thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> um, and speaking of your wife and your personal relationships, how important is it for you to have that support system around you? And how do you cultivate that? What tips do you have for, for us for cultivating that? Yeah, with, with, we can't do this alone. There's, there's no way. So the support system is frankly something that we need to, or that I need to figure out. And you do too, as you, as you work towards different goals, work your way through before you even start. Mm. Um, so my, my tips there, are, I mean, without it, you're not gonna be able to stretch your goals the way you want to. And so others need to know your why we talked about your why Evan needs to know what that why is and, and get their buy-in on it. So that, again, they can support you along the way when you're down, they can lift you up when you're feeling emotional about not wanting to do something They remind you why you said you wanted to do it. Uh, and they can check your thinking, if you will, when you get distracted uh, and when you're not going through the, the progress that you're expected to. Um, but there's a lot of different categories of uh, of support, if you will. I think from a financial perspective, every year I got to work through this financially to have the right sponsors supporting me because without that, I can't achieve it, especially as a Paralympic athlete. We don't get paid <laughs> big dollars. You know, how do you make a lot of money doing paracycling? You go in with a lot more to start, right? <laughs> um, and so having that financial support and being able to, especially at this level, when you're competing against the best in the world, they have that support. You got to find every marginal gain you can possibly find. Um, coaching, external coaching, so specifically with hand cycling, but with any area in life, you can try and find coaching. Again, our emotions can lead us down the wrong path and outside perspective will really remind us what we're trying to do in a much more clear way. You know, for me currently, after that crash, for example, I come back and I, I'm forced to take three weeks off, which I've never done for hand cycling. And my coach called me when I was on the plane and said, I'm glad you crashed because <laughs> oh. I knew you needed to take time right. off. And we talked about it, but I didn't know you were going to listen to me. <laughs> were you crying because you were bored? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I was just crying on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I came back and taking the break was great. And but as soon as I got back to it, I was going too hard and having that external support to say, you need to slow down right now. I don't want you to get it all back right at once. And I want a slow build. Here's where I want you to peak. Simply doing things the way I once did might not be the right thing. So that external again perspective from a coaching perspective. And then the other category is just your employer. If you're trying to do something in life, find an employer that's going to give you the flexibility and that work life balance to 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 give you that flexibility, but to agree that what you're doing is important. So I work for an employer, which is fantastic. They, they are so supportive because they agree with my goals. They love my goals. They ask about them. They want to do whatever they can to support it. And it's not a one-time thing. They're continuously trying to make sure that I achieve what I'm trying to achieve. And I think I think this is this, this becoming more prevalent, I think, right now in the marketplace, where especially post-COVID, where things are becoming more flexible. Um, Work-life balance is more important to people, and employers are recognizing that. So um, absolutely something that that you need. Yeah, definitely. I'm also curious about, because I think this is something that a lot of us can relate to is um, like personal, like your partner. Um, how how do you show up? How does your partner show up for you, your wife, mm -hmm. to help you reach your goals? And conversely, how do you show up for her? It's It's about knowing and looking after them for what they really need. Um, mm -hmm. So I read a book called Keeper of the Garden. And and so I have to think about what 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 makes her soul happy. Yeah. What does she? What's her love language? What does she think is most important? Because I can go out and try and help as much as I can. I can do the dishes. I can vacuum the floors and get the kid ready. But what really is going to help her in her day and make her feel at peace at home? Mm. And so it's those things that I need to continuously evaluate. As I sometimes we just we just go, we go, we go. So I did the dishes, and I brushed the kids' teeth, and I did this. And why are you still on me? It's it's not about that. It's about how do we find peace, and how do I help keep the peace in the home by knowing what matters most to her? Mm. What was that book called again? Uh, Keeper of the Garden. Keeper of the All right, Morgan, take note of that one. <laughs> Keeper of the Garden. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been very enlightening and inspiring for me. Um, if anyone has questions for Travis, we have a few more minutes. Please just drop them in the comments. Anything at all. Um, how he uses tonal, what his favorite tonal program is, what he likes to eat after he races, anything. Um, drop it in the comments. And in the meantime, Travis, please do tell us what does it mean for you to be your strongest? One of those fantastic slogans and questions there is, because it really is, you are your own definition, right? We don't compare yourself to others. 
Compare yourself to yourself. What are your limits? Like we talked about, reach them, find them, break them, redefine them, repeat. It's all about what you can do and, and not knowing what that is until you go out and really discover it and then break through that. Know why it is you're doing what you're doing. And like we talked about, don't let emotions get in the way. You can be your best person by embracing your emotions and going through the therapy process like we did today. Uh, but when it comes to making decisions about the direction in your life, but whether or not to do something, focus on what you know to be true when you set your goals. Be true to yourself and stretch yourself as far as you can go. And that's your definition. I love it. That's so true about the emotional component because I think we can just get really swept up in that. Um, and so allowing yourself to go through that but not get carried away with it right. uh, and to process it so that your logical brain can come back, I think is huge. Absolutely. Awesome. And where can people find you if they end up having questions or just want to follow your journey? Yeah, best way to follow the journey and even to DM me with questions is on Instagram. So Travis.Gertner is my handle, T-R-A-V-I-S dot Gertner. I've been saying it wrong this whole time. No, oh, did you? I didn't even notice, to be honest with Say you. Gartner. Gertner. That's close. Gertner, oh, yes. That's the, the Canadian in you. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> handle is Travis.Gertner. And I um, that above. What's that? I linked uh, your handle above. Perfect. Love it. Very good. So that's, I, I try to post as much as I can about the journey there, especially with events. And as I'm going through it, um, you can DM me there as well and i um, happy to connect. And I know you have a website. Do you also keep that updated or is that a good place for people to learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, gertnergold.com. Cool. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Travis. I know you're very busy and I appreciate you hanging out with me for an hour, an hour, taking time out of your day. I think it's time to get the kids ready for bed if they're not in bed by eight. <laughs> yes, this is exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let you go do that. Um, thank you again. We'll connect soon as we always do. And we're all rooting for you. So please keep us updated. Post updates in the community. Let us know how it's going for you. Thanks, Kate. Cool. Thanks, Travis. Good night, Not everyone. Good. Thank you good so night. much. See you soon. Bye-bye.